So you guys, uh, you read Fed 10 and you have no idea what's happening. Um, I, I, I can empathize with you very much so. Um, I, I wanna say a few things before we start this. Um, first off, you only have two Federalist or Anti-Federalist papers to go for the entire rest of the year. So you've made it through more than halfway. Um, and also this is definitely the hardest one out of all of them. I mean, Brutus one was difficult, but in terms of the Federalist papers, this is the most difficult Federalist paper to understand. So if you guys, you know, during, during that assignment were kind of lost, um, one, you're not crazy, two, you're not alone. So um, I just want to make this video to kind of go over uh, some of the highlights from Fed 10 and maybe fill in some of those gaps of knowledge uh, that might be there after you guys uh, just spent like an hour <laughs> reading through uh, that beast of a document and answering those questions. So Fed 10, as you know, is written by James Madison. Um, James Madison, you know, widely considered uh, the founder of our current republic. Uh, he, he did quite a bit to, to shape it into what it is today, right? So in one word, the main theme of Federalist 10 is, you probably can gather that one from the reading, and that is factions. So uh, Fed 10 is all about factions. Whenever you see Fed 10 in an FRQ or just in a multiple choice question, your mind immediately needs to think factions. So this is Madison's definition of a faction. I'll read that and then you know we'll kind of talk about it. So Madison defines a faction as a number of citizens, whether amounting to a minority or a majority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest, adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. To put that into English, a faction is basically just a group of people that have you know, relatively similar ideas who want to band together and try to do whatever it is that they can do to make that idea a reality. Now, factions are always gonna be competing against other factions, especially factions with opposite ideas. So for example, um, you know, maybe you feel very strongly about the second amendment, right? Maybe you, you really, really, really want to own as many guns as you can. You don't want any kind of restrictions on your ability to do that. Um, that's just kind of your jam and you want to do that with, uh, with your time. You could join a group of people who are like-minded. Uh, the NRA, for example, comes to mind as a faction that uh, is particularly interested in how the Second Amendment is interpreted. Um, you can band together with a bunch of those guys. You can lobby uh, Congress. You know, you can try and, and influence their decisions by presenting data to them or, um, you know, just talking them through why your ideas are better than everyone else's. Um, and perhaps that congressman or woman uh, will agree with you and you know, maybe they'll put a bill on the floor to uh, kind of help you out, right? Now, on the other hand, a different person might feel strongly the opposite way, right? Maybe they want to really um, crack down on gun ownership. Maybe they want uh, you know, increased background checks or you know, banning of assault rifles, wh whatever, whatever the, the case may be, they could join. Um, a group of people such as Moms Demand Action, or it, uh, there's, there's plenty. Um, and those guys can do the exact same thing. So those two factions would be competing against each other. And compromise is generally the result of that. Either a compromise or a complete inaction would be the kind of the two results. So why do factions exist? Important question. So factions exist essentially because of liberty. So liberty is the source of factions. And in, in America, we have a lot of that, right? Got my, got my little flag in the background right here, right? So in America, we have a ton of liberty and freedom, right? We've even got it codified in the Bill of Rights. So here's essentially like, I don't know, a little summary of how this happens, if you're taking notes, I would definitely recommend putting down the bolded and underlined parts here. So because our liberty in America allows us to speak freely about how the government should function, right? We have freedom of speech, 
We have the ability to petition the government. We can assemble um, and protest about what's going on, right? We have all kinds of means of expressing our opinions. Because we can express our opinions, it's essentially inevitable that we're gonna to band together with like-minded individuals and advocate for our ideas. So because liberty exists, factions exist. That's just human nature. If liberty, for example, is taken away, as Madison says, we should not do, right? If you remove liberty, you do remove factions, but removing liberty is completely un-American, right? We would never do that. So speaking of liberty, right, we've got a, a dictionary definition on the right side here um, in case you don't know what this word is. So Madison obviously argues that liberty is central to all of this. Um, he says liberty is the most important thing in a society. And this is a fantastic quote here, right, straight from Fed 10. Liberty is to faction what air is to fire. So. I mean, what areas to fire, right? It's the cause and it also allows it to continue. It allows it to grow, same here. But right, you take away air, fire goes out. You take away liberty, factions are eliminated, right? So it's, uh, liberty is necessary for society as a whole to exist, right? And this is why we can't get rid of it, right? That would be so un-American. Um, it's necessary for society to exist, but it does have dangerous effects. Factions are dangerous, right? Madison talks about all these different ways that factions can end up oppressing people. And Madison is very concerned about tyranny of the majority, right? So a majority faction taking power and oppressing everybody else and not letting anyone else's ideas come to the forefront. So minority, the opposite of majority, right? Minority rights are incompatible with tyranny of the majority. And Madison has to figure out a way for those two things to be reconciled. How do we keep minority rights while also factions exist, right? How do we do that? So here's Madison's ideas and I'm just gonna put my face on his, right? Now I look nice and astute. So, Two ways Madison believes that factions can be dealt with like this. So you, one, you can remove the causes. And we've already kind of touched on this, right? If you remove the cause, which is liberty, that means essentially you'd be forcing everybody to think the same way, act the same way, worship the same way. All these things that in America we are completely opposed to 100% of the time. So you can't do this. Right? If you destroy liberty, you essentially destroy the value that America holds most dear. So you can't remove the cause. So you must control the effects of factions. Factions are inevitable because liberty exists. And because factions are inevitable, we must structure our government in a way that can control them. So, Here's Madison's solution. Well, one, we need to elect competent representatives, people who understand that we need to protect minority rights, even though people are allowed to have their own opinion. Minorities obviously are not gonna have as strong of a voice because there's less of them, right? This way you can pass laws and balance all of the diverse interests in this country. Now, when it comes to factions, again, I kind of already mentioned this, factions are going to work with and against these representatives. So factions are gonna say, hey, here's what I think, here's why I think this, and here's what I think you should do about it. Those three things, they're going to express those opinions to representatives in Congress. Now, the opposite faction, right, is also gonna do the same thing, Right? All kinds of factions are going to be constantly lobbying these Congress folks to get them to pass laws to further the interests of the faction. What happens when you know, this system is going on is gridlock. And the term gridlock is, is essentially a slowing down of government action, generally as a result of conflict. 
Now, in Brutus 1, as you already read, Brutus hates gridlock. He says, federal government isn't going to be able to get anything done. There's going to be squabbling with each other all the time. And we're just going to be sitting around with a problem on our hands that they can't fix. Madison, on the other hand, he says, gridlock is great. Gridlock means that there's a discussion happening. That means we've got all these different groups of factions who want their way, but they can't get it. And it's up to that lawmaker and his colleagues, right? So all of the lawmakers together to come up with a compromise to please the factions, but also to protect minority rights and also to further the general welfare of society as a whole. So controlling the effects is significantly better than removing the causes, right? You remove the causes, you destroy liberty. You control the effects of factions and you do that through gridlock resulting from diverse opinions. So he also contrasts rep uh, a republic and a democracy quite often in Fed 10, right? So in an unstable government, now that could be essentially any, according to Madison, right? Anything that is not a republic. Madison is a big republic fan, which we currently have, right? He got his way. But anything that is not a republic, he would consider an unstable government, especially a pure democracy. Now, pure democracy is what he is comparing all of these arguments to. Now, in an unstable government, he says conflicts are solved by the superior force of an interested and overbearing majority. Now, what he means by this is tyranny of the majority. And that is, you have a faction that is more powerful and more numerous than all of the others, and those guys just solve conflicts the way they want them solved. And that usually results in the oppression of all of the other people in society. That faction is going to do what's best for them, so everyone else is screwed. So in a pure democracy, you cannot protect the rights of minorities. This is why we need a republic, according to Madison, because in a republic, you have these representatives who are competent and each faction is going to try and convince that representative to do their bidding. That representative is going to be smart about this, right, and come up with a compromise or come up with just a general plan for everyone's welfare. Now, the first objective for government, or excuse me, of government, according to Madison, he, he kind of starts Federalist 10 out with this, right? So the first objective of government is to protect the rights of men in the state. And obviously I put just for men in there because uh, throughout this entire thing, he keeps saying men in exchange of people because back then, obviously we had some issues uh, with sexism. Well, we still have issues with sexism, right? But especially back then it was codified in the law uh, so it drives me nuts every time I read a Federalist paper because they do this. But taking that aside and in your mind, replacing the word men with people, right? Protecting the rights of people in the state is the number one objective of government. It's not pleasing factions. It's not enriching themselves, right? It's protecting people's rights. And this includes minority rights. That's why a republic functions so well, is because you don't have this tyranny of the majority that is prevalent in democracies. Now, Madison's view on human nature significantly informs his arguments. So he argues that humans are inherently evil. And in saying this, what he's saying is that human nature is selfish, it is greedy, right? The, the average human is not looking out for people that are not like themselves. They don't care about other folks, they care about themselves. Because that's the case, he says factions are gonna function similarly. And he says here, right, we know that moral nor religious motives can be required, or excuse me, can be relied on as an adequate control so they're saying that people's moral compasses 
and any religion that people might follow are not sufficient to stop said person from oppressing other people. And I think there are plenty of examples of that throughout our country's history, right? So Madison says the solution is the style of government that we choose, and that is a republic. So human nature is inherently evil. That means factions, which are ruled by people, and people are not perfect, obviously. Factions are also inherently evil. Therefore, we need to control the effects of factions. We can't just let people do whatever they want. Competent representatives need to be able to facilitate compromise and to pass legislation that is best for society as a whole, as opposed to simply doing the biddings of the majority faction. Now, we've already kind of talked a little bit about this uh, uh, dichotomy between democracies and republics, but just to go over it specifically, tyranny of the majority is, is the big deal here. So in a democracy, tyranny of the majority is inevitable. Majority rules, right? I mean, throughout school, I'm sure there have been instances where you've had to vote on something and the, the thing that got the most votes passed and every other idea failed. And if you were on that losing side, you probably felt like shit, right? That's because that's how democracies work. Whatever is best for the most people is what we're gonna do. But the reality is that oppresses minorities. And I, I'm using minority, right, you know, in that sense to refer to smaller factions, right? But the reality is, and especially in America, racial minorities, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, all kinds of, of you know, people that don't fit the uh, uh, majority mold in America, right, are oppressed currently, they'd be even more oppressed in a democracy. So tyranny of the majority is on the forefront of Madison's mind when he's writing Fed 10 because he sees that oppression of other people, especially people who don't have as much uh, self-efficacy uh, is a very real threat. And he needs to create a system that's going to stop tyranny of the majority to the greatest extent possible. You know, if, for example, if we had tyranny of the majority, if we had a pure democracy, right? Just imagine how long slavery would have continued. Imagine how many things, how many laws would be passed in our society that ban immigration, that restrict religion, all of these kinds of things because the majority, especially in the early days of our country, was very conservative and very opinionated. America turned into the country it is today because we didn't have this tyranny of the majority to the extent that a democracy would. The American dream is possible because you start in the minority and you work your way up to become powerful and wealthy. This can't happen in a pure democracy. That's Madison's core argument when it comes to why we need a republic as opposed to a democracy. So there are some problems with republics, right? He does concede this. And I think it's important that he does, right? Because there's not a perfect system of government that exists, but at least he does have some kind of remedy that he argues for, right? So he says, problem number one with a republic, if there are too many elected officials, they will only care about their home district. Now in Brutus, Brutus would say, great. They should care about their home district. That's why we sent them there. But here he says, people should be looking out for everyone's welfare, not just the folks who necessarily sent them there. So he says, if you've got too many electors, they're only gonna care about their home district. But if you have too few electors, they're only gonna care about federal interests and keeping their power, right? As opposed to uh, working for the greater good of society. So in a republic, he says, you've got to get representation under control. You've got to figure out the sweet spot 
and you got to stay there. And he says that that sweet spot essentially is limiting the amount of electors in the federal system, um, but having a large republic, right? So you extend your republic as large as possible. You get as many people involved in the process as you can, right? But you make sure that there needs to be a significant amount of voices to elect one person. That way they elect the best possible person, right? And that person's looking out for a diverse amount of interests because even within that person's own constituency, there are a diverse amount of interests. So last piece here is just general main takeaways. One, a large Republic is needed to control the effects of factions. And I feel like we've heard large Republic, large Republic coming from these Federalist papers over and over and over again. There's a lot of merits to it, according to these guys. And in this case, a large republic controls the effects of factions because the more people you have in your country, the more factions you have in your country. And the more factions you have in your country, the more gridlock occurs, the more debate has to happen, the more compromises must occur. And the result of that is the best possible laws that you can get in terms of the greater good. Only the best possible laws come out of gridlock. And that is either a fantastic law that benefits literally everybody or more likely a compromise that protects the rights of the minority while still you know, giving uh, the majority a concession. I just explained this, but at least it's codified now. More people equals more representatives equals more gridlock. And gridlock is a good thing, according to Madison. It's a terrible thing, according to Brutus. But according to Fed 10, gridlock is good because only the best ideas and compromises can make it through that gridlock. Factions are inevitable, right, because of liberty. And factions are the way that citizens can influence their government. That also means you have an informed population. Now, Madison doesn't, doesn't super harp on this necessarily in Fed 10. He does in some of his other Federalist papers. But when you think factions, you also need to think, oh, this is a good thing for a people staying involved in politics as well, right? Because they're going to advocate for themselves. They have to understand the status quo in order to know what needs to be fixed, right? And lastly, this system, a republic, a large republic in specific, right, with fairly regulated representation results in majority rule with minority rights still protected. And that is the goal of constructing this perfect, or at least as perfect as possible union that Madison kind of started his paper describing. He says, we need to form a well-constructed union, but how do we do it? Here's all these problems and we need solutions. The thing is so dang long because there's a lot of solutions that are necessary. But if you put all of those together and you've got competent representatives, this is a perfect system. That's what Madison's arguing. So I will, I will let you guys go. Um, we're gonna kind of put these ideas to, uh, ta to task, right? And we're gonna, we're gonna apply them to some of the upcoming uh, stuff that you guys can learn. So I will catch you guys later. If you got any questions on uh, Fed 10, please give me an email or text. See you later.